falls into the sacred history. Uh, prior to Elijah, he's up here. Let me, let me just write him above. Hey, well, I'm going to put Samuel down here because he's very important. Samuel uh, is 1,171 years before Christ. That's according to Usher. This, these are all BC dates. And he fits in, I'll put an asterisk right here for you. He fits in up here before Elijah, uh, after Abraham. The reason I have creation the flood in Abraham is because I want you to see there were prophets prior to these. But these are the ones that gave a testimony uh, connected with the, uh, well, there was another one who gave a testimony connected with it too. These are the ones that laid the foundation. But these ones come after Moses. These are, the, these are the prophets I'm interested in after Moses. Samuel being the first, then Elijah, Jonah, Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Joel, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Lamentations, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And these are the dates that they appear chronologically in the sacred word. Now, I believe when I did this before, I think this is the... Uh, this is the date uh, that Usher gives for the book of Samuel, but I believe these dates here I took out of the uh, SDA Bible Commentary and some other resources I have at home. I, don't believe, I believe these are, I think, the uh, the birth or the time in, in which these men uh, came into uh, uh, their prophetic office. I don't remember which it is, but anyway, it's close enough that it gives you some idea of the uh, chronological order of the prophets. The uh, one thing I would like to uh, have this for is, I haven't done it yet, but it would be a nice thing if you could take an old King James Bible and tear off the spine and place these prophets in that order and then read them. If you do, you're going to find a different picture. You're going to decide, you're going to find a continuity that otherwise we don't see now in the scriptures. Well, they, they do, they have one. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, really? Oh, there you go. Um, you don't have to tell on it. And, and uh, uh, so the, the importance of this to our study, uh, I'm going to use the other board here in a minute, so let me do some other explanations while you guys jot that down. And I won't erase it. I'll put it over here somewhere. Uh, now, first Peter get the text. Has something to say about this, and so does uh, Acts chapter 4. But first, let's look at uh, Peter. The name of this uh, talk I gave at Blythe was called The Things the Prophet Desired to Look Into. And uh, Peter has this to say about these men. He says, verse 9 of 1 Peter, he says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. What chapter? This chapter. Is, uh, chapter 1, verse 9 of 1 Peter. It says, notice verse 9 again, it says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. These prophets are talking about the salvation of every human being. That's the main theme. Then he says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they administer the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Angels and prophets desire to look into these things. And at the end of the world, God's people should have this desire. And I hope maybe by this study it will uh, help us in our desire. Now, something interesting about the prophet Samuel, he's mentioned in the book of Acts. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4. We're all very familiar, since we're Bible students, with uh, the book of Acts. When 
understand that uh, the role that the apostles played in the early work of the church, but I, this is on the day of Pentecost. Uh, 
Isaiah's allowed to view. But this is the most holy place scene. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So here Isaiah now is including himself. Uh, Ellen White says prior to this vision, Isaiah thought of himself a pretty good guy. He was of the lineage of David, and he was a prophet, and he was a, he was a priestly cat. Now, that makes you a pretty good guy, doesn't it? But here, you see Christ high and lifted up in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. Isaiah sees that he's undone. So this should tell us something about uh, the Laodicean message. The Laodicean message is really a message about seeing Christ in the most holy place. The Laodicea doesn't come to the churches until after our 1844. So when we, when, we, when we transpose Isaiah's experience into the experience of uh, Sabbatarian Adventism, you begin to see something uh, again of the continuity of what the prophets are trying to tell us about. So all the prophets are telling the same story is what we want to start with to understand. And I'm going to set this down. And Jamal talked last night on the 2520 in these charts. And that's where we're going to go now. Uh, turn to Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 23. William Miller is a real, uh, I, Tim and Edson I call the giants in uh, Edmonton. The reason so is because they had an ability to, God gave both men a quite an understanding of the Word of God. And Miller pointed out something uh, on, if you have the Pioneer CD ROM, you can type this text in. And just type in, uh, for instance, uh, Reformed by me. Verse 23 it says, And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me. If you type in the words be reformed by me, you can get a study that Miller does on this subject. And uh, I didn't bring it with me today. I was going to, but I just have to go But what it is, is, is that Miller saw that there, are, there is no other reform movement in this world except from God. Amen. And this reform movement was started when he brought the people that were, were not a people out of Egypt. <clears throat> and what it was was Sabbath reform. And in this book, Life Incidents by James White, and this book, which is a later edition of the same story, this is uh, Life Sketches of James Mellon White, they redid it. Uh, and uh, this was done just shortly after the death of James. He died in 81, and this is 1888. This is, I believe, 1868. So this is quite early. But both are a uh, must read for Seventh day Advent. And James says in these books that what took place in the Advent movement after the disappointment, they began to see that it was Sabbath reform. And that was the uh, message of the third angel. That parallel with the time of Moses cannot be overlooked as you consider the testimony of the prophets. They bring those two stories together into one story. That's what it does. And in Leviticus, the reform movement that is being referenced is the Sabbath reform movement. He says, if you will not be reformed by me, and as they came out of Egypt, the first thing they were given was the Sabbath reform. And so the curse of Leviticus 26 has to do with the breaking of God's holy Sabbath. And if you take what Jamal said and apply what I just said and bring those two testimonies together, and what he did last night, you begin to see a wide spectrum of how this is one story leading down to the end of the world. And we have here shortly coming uh, Sunday law that is going to trample upon God's holy Sabbath. So it's imperative understanding this 
that there was an importance of understanding Advent Millerite Sabbatarian Advent history that is the most important history that was ever been given to us. <coughs> Nothing else is more important than that. Because it brings us down to the close of human probation. It brings us down to the time when our character can be perfected and we're going to uh, be like our dear Savior. That was his intention for, for the Israelites. His intention was not for them to go into captivity. His intention was not for them to receive the curse of the seven times. But he knows the human frame, he knows that we are but dust, and he made provisions for the failure of the church in the wilderness. Uh, now, to the Advent movement, uh, you've heard all week long, which was just a few days now, but with the time we've been here, I'm going to try to do this this morning. This is a lot of information, so bear with me. This is going to take a lot, a long time, by. This is 1798. And we don't need to go into what all that entails. It's the time of the end, the demise of the papacy of his civil power. Berthier took the Pope captive. It's the uh, fulfillment of the time clock. Time prophecy, the fulfillment. It begins our story. Uh, and what we have here is uh, on August, it was August the 14th of 1831. That Miller was invited to his neighbor's house to preach his first sermon on the uh, second coming. This day, August 14th, 1831. We're seeing here progressive revelation, and we're also seeing an increase of knowledge, like Jeff said last time. It's an increase of knowledge with progressive revelation being the instrument to allow this. And what, we, what begins it is the end of the time prophecy. And then the next thing we see on, now there's more things on this between what I'm going to tell you and the next data I'm going to give you, but this keeps it down short enough so we can do it in an hour. Your homework is to go home and fill in the blanks. Okay? Uh, Revelation 9.15 on August 11th, 1840. Can you write larger, please? Uh, well, I can, <laughs> but I got a lot to put on here. Uh, so here we have. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them as I write them. So I'm gonna go slow enough so you can get them all. This is August the 11th of 1840. August 11th, 1840, and this is Revelation chapter nine, verse 15. That's, that's, that's represented on the charts. It's, it's the Ottoman Empire. It's the, it's the story of uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire when uh, they ceased to be a kingdom. Josiah Lynch brought this into history. I guess I could fill this in. I didn't put it, but he actually predicted it in 1838, two years before the event. Lynch. He predicted the event of the fall of the Ottoman Empire in an article that appeared in the Science of the Times in 1838. And then later published in a little pamphlet that he did that was uh, pretty much well read around the, uh, the Millerite uh, time period leading up to uh, August 11, 1840. Because he predicted by the... Uh, uh, well, let's look at it real quick. Revelation chapter 9. Three hundred ninety-one years and fifteen days. Verse fifteen. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for the hour, the day, and the month, the year, to slay the third part of men. Lynch actually took the year-day principle, and he took the day, the month, and the year, 
uh, and he showed that it was 391 years and 15 days. So he said from uh, this date right here, 1449, you can count down and it comes up August 11, 1840. So from 1449, if you add 391 years and <coughs> days, from uh, July, 27. July the 27th, from July the 27th, uh, you come to, to this point in history. This is when the angel comes down with his power and lightens the earth with his glory. Revelation chapter, chapter 10 and verse 1. So in the book of Revelation, these two stories collide. The testimony of uh, the first angel, which, uh, which comes down into history, on, uh, in Revelation 10.1, and the, the story of Revelation 9.15, it's not a coincidence they're back to back, because they come into history at the same time. The fulfillment of that prophecy and the first angel's message are simultaneous. Now this is progressive revelation after a time of darkness and uh, knowledge is increasing. In 1841, I put it in here because Sister White constantly makes reference to it. She says the messages that were preached in 1840, 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1843 are the messages that we are, that are, that we are to give today, now. In 1842, many things began to take place. So in 1842, you're going to have uh, Protestant churches close their doors. First Testimony is 121? Right. Page 21. First Testimony is page 21. Page 21? Or 121. Is it 121? When the... Uh, uh, Churches closed their doors in June. Is it 121 or 21? Page 21. Page 21. Page 21. Page 21. All right. It's first testimony, page 21. And they, the churches closed their doors in June of that year, of 1842. And last night, uh, another event took place in that same year. In May, the 1843 chart was published. In May of 42. So the 43 chart, this chart right here came into history. Now remember a while ago we said that the testimony of all these prophets consummated in this chart. Okay. So there took an event. Now Miller was, he understood what we were talking about. The, the pioneers understood these concepts. It wasn't foreign to them. Miller understood right away if he'd, been in the, if he'd been in the audience today, he'd have said, Amen. When I, when I just told you that all the prophets testified about this chart, Miller would have been the first to say, Amen, if he understood it. And it took the end of the time prophecy to begin to come to the proclamation of this chart. Now, look at the back of chapter 2. Revelation. Habakkuk. Pardon me? Habakkuk <coughs> will play a major role in the Millerite time period for a couple of reasons. The first one we're going to look at is for is rolled in the chart. Verse 2 of Habakkuk chapter 2, it says, For the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The conference they had in May of this year in Boston was uh, headed by Joseph Bates. And at that conference, uh, Lynch had uh, read this text. And so he presented before them the first copy of this chart that was hand painted on a canvas by him and a friend. I forget the friend's name, it's getting escaped me right now. But uh, it was unanimously accepted as the chart or the one that they were going to use. And 300 of them were printed. Uh, Leroy Froome gives a, a good little history of how it takes place. 
So this is Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, and that's verse 2. And verse 3. But on verse 3, we're going to use it at, at, in just a second down the road. And so, as you get down here, uh, also, remember, this is 1842. Also in 1842, now this is very important to understand for the idea of progressive revelation after the closing of a time period and uh, uh, the knowledge being increased. This is very, very helpful. I addressed it yesterday a little bit. But right here, we have a fellow by the name of George. Stores, S-T-O-R-R-S. Some people pronounce it Strohs, but it's Stores, S-T-O-R-R-S. And what he did was he understood uh, that he would, that the state of the dead, he understood that the dead are sleeping. So the state of the dead comes into Advent history by George Strohs. He produced six sermons. 1842, right here. Follow, follow down the line. 1842. Now, Miller believed, uh, well, I'm not sure that's the wrong note. Uh, another thing happens in 1842 that's very important. <laughs> Jeff will appreciate this. For those who are familiar with Brother Foy, anybody who's familiar with Brother Foy will appreciate this. In this same year, Brother, uh, what was his first name? William Boy. William Boy has his first vision in January of 1842, and he has another vision of February of 1842. So William Foy begins to have his visions uh, in January and February of that year. To see the first man to receive and reject messages being given? <laughs> no. No, but that's not the, that's not the, uh, he was not, that, that was Hazen Foss, but he's not on our timeline today, I didn't put him in. I put him in because of his relevancy to the midnight cry. This gentleman also had another vision later that is relevant to the midnight cry. Uh, here too we have the text of Revelation 14 6 and 7 that's the one for uh, the 1840 days the first angel's message comes into history Revelation uh, the Ottoman Empire the angel coming down all those are relevant and also we have uh Now right here, I'll put it, 1843 comes and goes, the Gregorian calendar year, it comes and goes, and This chart is based on the Julian, I mean, not on the Julian calendar year, but on the Jewish calendar year. So, 1843 January looks like this. Down to December of 1843. That's the Julian calendar year, 12 months. But the Jewish calendar year goes from spring to spring. So in the end of March to the first of April, depending on the barley harvest, the full moon, or full detail. The, Jew, the Jewish calendar year can begin in the end of March, around the 21st to the 24th, or even as far as far out as the 1st of April, or, and it goes out to the 
the same time the following year. So this is what they call the Jewish year. Even though it's extends itself down into 1844 Gregorian, this is April of 1844. This 12-month period here is the Jewish calendar year. This is critical in understanding that chart. Because if you don't, you're, it, it, it just went past you. You, just, you can't figure out what he's trying to say. The reason I'm telling you this is because it went past me and it took me a long time to figure this out. So, Maybe, maybe the rest of you don't need that, but I needed to know that. Has everybody got this? So when I say 1843 came and went up there, what came and went was the Jewish calendar year. Huh? And then we entered the tearing time. Here's where the parable of the ten virgins comes in. I'm going to make a little detour. One little detour. This is where Damascene's book is extremely important. Page 40. Page 40 of uh, Foundations of Seventh day Adventists, Message and Mission by Damascene. Page 40. In Advent history, there were two midnight cries. Prior to this line here, there was a midnight cry in the Advent history. And Miller based this on the parable of the ten virgins. But it was different than the parable of the ten virgins after the tearing time. When we come to the Exeter camp meeting, In August the 12th, uh, this is 1844. The tearing time begins in 44. On in uh, March on March the 21st of 1844, the tearing time begins. So. They, they've experienced their first disappointment. And the midnight cry that Miller taught leading up to this time period, and he knew this concept from 1819. Miller early got this concept of the midnight cry. But as it began to be brought, to be preached by 1831, he saw more relevancy in the, the parable of the ten virgins. Because they would equate it to their own history. So they historicized the parable of the ten virgins. They brought it into their own history, and they began to look at it from that standpoint. And this is what uh, Damstead says. He quotes Matthew 25, 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom come, go ye out to meet him. Uh, Matthew 25, 6. The expression the midnight cry had been derived from the parable of the ten virgins. In Jesus' eschatological discourse, and was seen by Millerites as the symbol of their missionary activity. Eschatology means last day events. This parable was historicized by applying it specifically to the contemporary setting of the Advent movement. So from here, the tearing time of 1798 is the contemporary time of the Advent movement. So they brought that parable down into their own history and they looked at the parable and say, this is our history. And then they decided to take things out of the parable and put labels on it, like human beings do. We like to label things. He says, Miller now says, uh, the kingdom of heaven in the parable is interpreted by Miller as the gospel day or circle of God's government. The gospel day or circle of God's government. under the gospel dispensation. And he gives a text. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. Luke 16, 16. 
the ten virgins as mankind in general in a probationary state. So he saw the ten virgins, not like they did after the tearing time, but he saw them now as the world in a probationary state. After the tearing time, the parables is seen altogether differently. But at this point, he sees it as all the world in a probationary state. <coughs> including both Jews and Gentiles. Now, I like this because Paul saw this similarly in some respects. In Galatians, he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. It's very, very similar, but uh, that's just a little side point. And he gives a text for this too. Uh, Isaiah 52, 1 and 5. Uh, the wise virgins, as the believers in God, are the children of the kingdom. That is Psalms 54, 13, and 14, and Lamentations 2, 13. And it's really important that you look these up. You should buy this book. Uh, Future for America has it for sale at the camp meeting this week. I uh, would get a copy of it while you're here because it's kind of hard to get a copy of this thing. You can get it through Andrews, but they have it. Can you say the last two verses? Yes, I can. The one for mankind in general is Isaiah 52, 1 through 5. The wise virgin, as the believers in God or the children of the kingdom, is Psalms 45, 13, and 14, and Lamentations 2, 13. The foolish virgins, all, as the unbelieving class of mankind, while in a probationary state under the, under the means of grace. Now, this is Isaiah 47, 1, Jeremiah 46, 11. He saw the lamps as a figure of the word of God. Psalms 119, 105, and Proverbs 6.23. The oil he saw as a representation or emblem of faith, as oil which produces light by burning, so does faith and exercise by the fire of love produce more light and gives comfort in adversity, hope, and darkness. Love for the coming of the bridegroom. And he takes the Songs of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 2, and he takes 1 John 2.27. The MC goes on, he says, furthermore, he identified the vessels with the persons or mind that believers or disbelievers in the word of God. And he used 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, 2 Timothy 2.21, and the bridegroom was Christ. And he has Isaiah 62.5 and Matthew 9.15. The marriage he saw is the time when Christ shall come the second time to this earth to present the church as his bride to the Father and marry her so that he will be forever with him in the New Jerusalem. Page uh, 41, 40 and 41. The midnight cry of Matthew 25, 6, we know defined as the watchman, or some of them who by the word of God discover the time is revealed and immediately give the warning voice. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So the very text that they used during the uh, Midnight cry of August the 12th, 1844 to August the 22nd, 1844, Behold, the bridegroom cometh going out to meet him, was the same identical cry that they used in the first part of their history. And they used it for the same reason. The same reason was that it was announcing uh, the coming of the bridegroom. He says, uh, This, this fulfillment he saw being accomplished in the current widespread preaching of the eminence of the Second Advent based on the exposition of the 2300 days. What them, what them teach me is, is because the evidence that the Bible gives on this chart, uh, they saw that this parable uh, in the way I've just described it from Dampsey's book. <coughs> now, until you look at this for yourself, this will be a... Uh, a subject that will remain uh, kind of distant. You won't be able to grasp it until you read this stuff for yourself. And you try to bring, bring this stuff into your own understanding, and then you're going to understand it much better. It's kind of hard to give a talk on this. I realized that after I started this, that uh, to understand this just in the talk like I'm giving is very difficult, but I'm giving this to you as a hope that you will uh, look at it yourself. In at the at the tearing time, uh, 
By August the 12th of 1844 at the Exeter camp meeting, there's a new man that comes on the scene. Well, actually, he came on the scene a little earlier than that, and I'll explain. But here in August, I'll put him down here, the 12th, we have S. S. Snow. And this is the Exeter camp meeting. In New Hampshire. And uh, this is where John is here. Where's John? John, raise your hand. I don't see you. From Little Linda. He was here a minute ago. He asked me one day in church, what's the seventh month movement? Well, this is the answer. The seventh month movement begins right here. <coughs> This is where we get the term. Yesterday on the board, I put some terms. And the terms were uh, Behold, the bridegroom comes. I put uh, up here uh, the seventh month, the definite time. Midnight cry. I'm forgetting one right now, but I'll think of it. These are all synonymous terms for the seventh month movement. When the writers of uh, after this period began, all the periodicals in the Advent world, the Advent uh, Herald. I made a note to myself this morning, but the date isn't that important. But right in this period here, uh, between March. And the August date, they had a periodical in uh, uh, the Advent movement, which also came into history right here. In 1840, the Signs of the Times became a part of history. Signs of the Times. Now, that was a Millerite periodical produced by Joshua B. Hines. It had its name changed right here between the tarrying time, it becomes the Advent Herald. They changed its name. Very important to know this because when you're reading these books, you want to be able to distinguish that because then you know what you're reading about. You, you, you have a, a, a I do I do burglar alarms for a living. Sometimes I have to go into an attic, and I have to find a certain place in an attic, and you have to have a landmark so you know where you're at in the attic. Because if you don't if you don't have that landmark, you might drill through the lady's kitchen ceiling. You don't want that. You don't want that. This gives you a landmark in here. This landmark says we have the signs of the time. This says we have now the Advent Herald, and they're the same period, but they had their name changed. And, and they give a reason in Prune's book why they wanted to change the name. That's not important. The important part is that you know that Signs of the Times and Advent Herald are the same period. They just changed the name. So they didn't stop the printing of it, they just continued its printing. So there were so many volumes with the name this, and then it, the next volume picked up. Uh, that. I don't know if they, they made, they did, I think they did, they did an Advent Herald Volume 1, they started the volume number over, but otherwise it was just the same editors, the same deep merit press, came in, coming out of the same place. And also in the city of New York, Himes had a sister paper to the Signs of the Times, which was called The Midnight Cry, which was uh, edited by Sutherland or something like that, not Sutherland, but Sutherland, and, uh, but Himes was the, uh, genius behind it, and then Sutherland was the editor. And it was out of New York. And uh, so this is where we get to turn the seventh month movement. And now things really begin to uh, change. What does the seventh month movement mean? Oh, would you like to know what the seventh month movement means? <laughs> Now this is a study that uh, requires some uh, a little bit of time. Let me let me give it to you as quickly as I can. There's an article here from the, the Midnight Cry. This is the one printed in New York. This is the sister publication of the Signs of the Times, February the 22nd, 1844. This is Brother Snow's first article on the types 
before the Exeter camp meeting. In the Signs of the Times of 1843, there appeared an article by William Miller. And in this article, Miller first gives an account of the types. Now, the types of the spring festivals in the Jewish economy, we know they were <coughs> Passover, uh, Pentecost, the way she, those are the early ones, of the, early in the year, because uh, Passover was done in their first month, according to Exodus. And so that was done in what the Jewish calendar year would mark the, the month of Nisan, which would be our March. Okay? So, from that, Miller deduced, this is what Miller says. He says, uh, I will tell you, well, first of all, Bliss and uh, Sylvester Bliss, I haven't researched this out. I'll just read it. You guys can take it for what it's worth. But it, it needs to be researched so we can understand where Bliss was at for Miller to write the letter. But it says, my health is on, is on the gain, as my uh, folks would say. I have now only 22 vials from the bigness of a grape uh, to a walnut on my shoulder, side, back, and arm. This was Miller's experience, like Job. Boils everywhere. But he says, I'm in, he says uh, my health is on the gain. Job would say, praise the Lord. I am truly afflicted like Job. And about as many comforters, only they do not come to see me as did Job, and their arguments are not near so rational. I want to see Brother Bliss. I hope he is right about the termination of the periods, but I think not. Bliss had written an article on the termination of the periods. I will tell you why. If you will examine, you will find all the ceremonies of the typical law that were observed in the first month of the vernal equinox had their fulfillment in Christ's first advent and sufferings. And we won't go into this whole length of this letter, but I'll leave it and you guys can read it, okay? Uh, so, Miller introduces to the Millerite movement the first understanding. I didn't have to write it, I just read it. So Miller introduced the first understanding of the uh, the types beginning in the spring of the year, pointing to the first advent of Christ, and he was suggesting in this letter that the autumn types would point to Christ's second advent. Okay? This is what gave Snow the understanding that Christ would come in the seventh month. So the seventh month movement is the understanding that Christ would return according to the Levitical, the, ex, the types in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, according to the uh, Jewish calendar year, and it would be in the seventh month. And one of the most important things is that he understood, we all know there's a timeline zero error on the chart, but Snow also figured out that, let this back up, Snow also figured out that if you start, he understood from the book of Ezra that Ezra began to rebuild the city in the autumn. Now, at the beginning of 457, Jewish calendar year, and this is the Jewish kind of frame, but he began it in October of 457 BC. Now, we can't go into everything that's, I have, the, I have the study that Snow has, I have it with me. But it's very long and we ain't got that much time. So we're going to break it down very, very pretty quickly. So this is the beginning. This is the month of Nisan, 457 BC. This is October 457 BC. And Snow, because of his understanding of the autumn types, he saw that Christ would not come until the autumn of 1844. And specifically, he figured out August, October 22nd, 1844. This is the tenth day of the seventh month, because that was what they were celebrating the Day of Atonement on in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16 specifically points out it's the tenth day of the seventh month. Pardon me? 
Leviticus chapter 16. If you want the test, 2327. 2327, thank you. So in Leviticus 2327. Yes, chapter 16. Through 27. You can find that information. On the 10th day of the seventh month. So basically. This is the this is the testimony that he would give at the extra camp meeting, and they'd gone through the tearing time, they'd gone through the disappointment in, in that early spring of March of 1844, and this is what really put the fire under uh, the Millerites in the autumn of 1844. Now, if you understand, uh, for us just to say this history and to just uh, talk about it so nonchalantly, these people believed that Jesus was coming. They actually. Their, 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 their whole desire of their whole soul was to see their Lord and to have this world come to an end. Amen. So under, and, and because they had been so disappointed in the spring, this really added to their excitement. But one of the things that is told about the midnight cry, that it was not emotional. There was no, it was not an emotional uh, experience. It was calm. Uh, Everything about it, it was it, it solemn. And we read yesterday from this book that uh, it removed all fanaticism. There was no fanaticism whatsoever in this movie. People were serious about the confession and repentance of sin. Brothers made up, families made up, <coughs> things were done right, wrongs were made right. They were preparing to meet their Lord. And that's what the, that's the experience out of the extra camp meeting produced. If you go back to the beginning of my talk this morning and understand that this is what the prophets were pointing to and experience is what the prophets were leading up to. It wasn't just uh, sacred history for sacred history's sake, but God was leading the people until they would, it would produce two classes of people. Two classes of people. But let's finish this. What we have next. Well, why do you have Ezra's name there? What's that was his name. Uh, Samuel. I can't think of the middle name, but it starts with. No. I, I read it this morning. It's in Froome's book. We'll, we'll get it out and I'll tell you later what it is, okay? But his name is Samuel S. Snow. And he signed his word either S, he would sign it SSS, or he would sign it Snow. So you'll find all of those little idioms about him when you read the articles. He would later start his own periodical called the, the Jubilee Standard after the disappointment, but we won't, we won't get there today. Uh, so this is the Midnight Cry. Now, we need to understand the midnight cry a little differently. That's where Brother Froome's book comes in. Very, very handy. This is quick, this is easy, and uh, you'll get it right away. Augmenting Voices of the Midnight Cry, page 816. Next to the Day of Atonement type, Next to the Day of Atonement type urged by some, the second point of special emphasis, which gave force to the seventh month movement, was the cry at midnight, feature in the parable of the ten virgins. It was a paralleling argument, a paralleling argument. Those not convinced by the former were actually persuaded by the latter. In other words, if they weren't convinced by the autumn type, showing the tenth day of the seventh month. This was a parallel argument in the, out of the parable of the ten virgins that would convince <coughs> those who would not accept. In other words, it was a testimony of two. Those not convinced by the former were usually persuaded by the latter. The one augmenting the other, testimony of two. Observe the setting for this new emphasis. Miller's early concept of the midnight cry, his early concept, of the midnight cry. In the application of the parable to their own day, 
There were two progressive stages of interpretation during the Millerite movement. Miller's early application was to the general advent awakening of the 19th century. Damstead describes it a little better, but Brooms calls it the awakening of the 19th century. The wise virgins were the believers, the foolish, the unbelievers, and the probationary states, the lamps, the revival, the oil, the faith, the vessels, mind, the, the, that believe, the bridegroom cries, the shut door, uh, the close of the mediation, the marriage, the second advent, uh, the gathering of the elect, and the midnight cry, the general advent awakening of the 19th century, and the old world as well as the new. Lynch had likewise held that the era of the Bible, missionary, and tract societies of the early 19th century was this same period of the awakening. And to this, the British Advent expositors themselves agreed. The leading Millerite journals, the Science of the Times, similarly declared, uh, the world has had the midnight cry, citing a list of witnesses in various parts of the world. Now, this is the midnight cry, this, this midnight cry. So when you read this literature, you've got to know which midnight cry you're reading about. Uh, the seventh month heralds giving time and the cry. <clears throat> But now, after the extra camp meeting onward, from this point onward, the heralds of the seventh month message contended that the previous cry, the previous cry was all on, that's right, over here. It's also called the cry. And over here, Miller, early on, Miller would call this. The cry. Okay? So you gotta know which cry when you read what you're reading about. Contended that the previous cry was only a general prelim pre preliminary alarm. So this was a general preliminary alarm. <laughs> and that the true midnight cry was now sounding in verity, thus Stroh would write. Now this is George Stro Storrs, rather, Storrs. Alas, we have all been slumbering and sleeping. Storms has now been able to explain the tearing time. We've all been slumbering and sleeping, both the wise and the foolish, but so our Savior told us it would be, and thus the scriptures are fulfilled. And it is the last prophecy relating to the events to precede the personal advent of our Lord, now comes the true midnight cry. Now the parable of the ten virgins is not just historicized history in general, the church history, but now it's a parable of the Advent movement. Huge difference. Huge difference. Now the parable is being applied to the experience that they're going to go through from August the 12th to October 22nd, 1844. Now they see that in Matthew 24 it said that the evil servant, the, they would begin to smite us. How does it go? Um, smite, smite his fellow servant, thank you. And they saw that uh, the, the parable now was showing how this was taking place. Because here, in this part of the cry, they had people fall out after the disappointment in 44 that weren't on in the message uh, after Exodus. We had a falling out here. Some never, they weren't at, they never embraced the second midnight cry. We had a falling out. They didn't pass the first angel's message. So it was a test. For some, they, they, didn't, they weren't along for the second test. We're going to get to the second test here. So, if you look this up in Prune's book and, and in Damstead's book, you're going to get a pretty clear picture of how the parable of the ten virgins uh, changes in this history. The, at, after the, before the midnight cry of August the 12th and after the midnight cry of August the 12th of 1844. Mm -hmm. Now also, here now is something very important. And I'm going to read uh, something about William Foy. Right here, I'm going to get this real close to this other line. We have the disappointment of October 22nd. Okay, I need something. When is the first time the midnight cry started? 
1819. 1819. Miller first realized the concept in 1819. And he preached it, he preached his first sermon on it in 1831. The second one begins August the 12th, 1844. So this is, the, this is the disappointment in October of 1844. Something else that takes place just in between, just, just days before the, the close of, of, of the, uh, the definite time, right here, Floyd has his last vision. This is very important. <coughs> That's where I'm going to read something. Bear with me here. This is important. Page 49. tell you about the first early visions first. I won't read that, but this is the last vision. Brother Troy's work continued until the year 1844 near the close of the 2300 days. Then he was favored with another manifestation of the Holy Spirit. A third vision was given, one which he did not understand. And this is really critically important for the role of Ellen White later, Ellen Harmon. In this, he was shown the pathway of the people of God to the, he to the heavenly city. Notice how it's described. He was shown the pathway of the people of God to the heavenly city. It's very similar to what the first vision was described. He saw a great platform. Yesterday we talked about a platform. A foundation was laid. Boy had this vision before the disappointment. Now if you let this sink in, you're going to see something about how the hand of God was in this movement. Prior to giving Ella White the midnight cry vision of December of 1844, God revealed all of this to Brother Floyd, and he gave him the vision of the midnight cry. But Floyd didn't understand it. He saw a great platform on which multitudes of people gathered. John saw a great multitude. There was no man to know. A great multitude, it says here, of which multitudes of people gathered. Occasionally, one would drop through this platform out of sight. Ellen White says they would step off the platform and examine. Uh, and some of these also dropped from the platform out of sight, and finally, a third platform appeared. What's the third platform? Anybody can tell me? The third angel's message. So, Foy had this vision. He was, God was trying to prepare them for something that was ahead. This is I was doing jury duty two years ago, and I bought that antique book. When were we at Cedar Falls? Four years ago? Who knows? But I read this book, and I suggest I gave it to him to read, and he's a fast reader, so he read it. I don't think he read it all, but I think he read a good portion of it that night. And uh, he came back that day, and he says we have a new book. And then I read some more and more, and I read some more, and then I was bored going to jury duty, and so I took the book with me. However, I go, I take that book, uh, and I read it again. And so I'm reading it again, and what I'm telling you today dawned on me that there's two midnight cries in Advent history. And I said to myself, well, I'm going to know that. I think this might be a little important. And sure enough, it's kind of important, especially when I found this piece here and added, <coughs> added it to my uh, dilemma. The dilemma was that I haven't been studying these things like I should for 35 years, and I'm just coming up to speed now. You know what I mean? So, once Floyd has the vision, there's something ahead, coming ahead. Now, you remember, Ellen White said something about this vision. It said that it would light the pathway of the people of God all the way to the city of God, and it's great light set up behind the people of God. Now, when they, James and Ellen White had a very peculiar way of talking about this experience. They would always describe it as a, uh, an experience that would allow them to see the past, the present, and the future. That's how they describe it. In many, many, many places, you can just, just type that in your uh, Pioneer CD-ROM or Ellen White's uh, <coughs> CD-ROM, and you're going to be amazed at what you see in this history. They would describe this history as past, present, and future. 
But what they didn't understand was that God was in charge of past, present, and future. On the ground at the time, they didn't quite catch it until after they went through the experience. But we're able to see here, God is the one who's in charge of the past, the present, and the future by graphing this out. So when God understood there was a future ahead for these Millerites that they didn't see, but he tried to show it before. He tried to lay out the groundwork. Now, this is extremely important. Here, the <coughs> December of 44, Sister White had her first vision. But James White tells us in Word of the Little Flock, page 22, you know how good God is, brothers and sisters? <coughs> this book is set on a shelf in my house. 1973, I still have this book. This is a book mark. I got this from Jim Nix in 1973 in the Heritage Room. And this sat on my shelf through my, I like to call it my scrap yard days when I was rebelling against God. But God preserved this little book so we can read it this morning. Amen. It says here about Ellen Harmon. When she received her first vision in December 44, when she received this first vision, this is the midnight cry vision, this is the famous one, where she saw a light set up behind the people of God, showing them their pathway all the way to the city of God. It was in Portland, Maine. When she received her first vision in December 44, she and all the band at Portland, Maine, where her parents then resided, had given up the midnight cry and shut door as being in the past. God, through his promise, <coughs> would have never given the spirit of prophecy to Ellen White had Brother Foy understood the vision. Because it would have bonified for them the genuineness of the midnight cry. But Ellen White had given it up. And after the disappointment, many had given up the midnight cry. They said it was of the devil. They said it was mesmerism. They said it wasn't from God. It said that they had been led by Satan. And Ellen White and her little group in Portland, Maine, they don't give the reasons why they gave it up, but they tell us that she gave it up. So now God is left with a dilemma. Boy is not going to do the work. Hazen Foss, who we haven't got on our charge here today, but he wasn't going to do the work that God had called him to do. So God has to pick on a person out that is the weakest of the weak. And maybe you'll understand a little bit more of Ellen White's comment when she says she was the weakest of the weak because she'd been through this experience and she was also physically in very bad shape. And her whole desire was to have Jesus come. If you, Jeff has, in other talks has, has brought out the work, the powerless work she would do for her neighbors and friends. She would pray for a hundred, is that right? A hundred. Until they all gave their hearts to the Lord. So it was this person that God gave the first vision to after the disappointment. When, when, this, when, this, when, this, when this increase of knowledge comes to the, when they were going to step off the platform, which she saw in vision said that they fell into the dark world below, the God of heaven had to do something. So he gave a little girl, 17 years old. We don't understand how good God is to seven the Adventists. Amen. And in this age of the world, when people will take and deny the spirit of prophecy, if they will, if we can get into one of these meetings and show, him, show them this history, they'll embrace the spirit of prophecy as they need to embrace it. Amen. Amen. Because the God of heaven knew there was something still ahead for not just Sister White and the group of Portland, but there was going to be a conference at Albany in 1845 called by Himes and Miller and George Storrs, Joseph Marsh, and the rest that were the Millerite leaders, and they in group would deny the validity of the Midnight Cry. <coughs> I got one minute to finish. Well, this might, we might have to pick up the other half of this tomorrow. So from here, 
We have another vision. She has a second vision. This is February of 1845. Now let's do the math. From October to December, it's not very long, right? A couple months. From uh, December, this is, this is, Luckborough says it was on the 31st. Ellen White won't give us the date, but John Luckborough thinks it's the 31st of December. It's at the end of the month, at least. This is the, in uh, early February. So we have less than 30 days later, she's given a second vision. Let me just share this and then we'll close. Let me find it. I have it here. Her two first visions would appear in a broadside. First, it would be published in uh, the Day Star, but later uh, it would appear James White would republish it in this broadside to the little remnant scattered abroad. In our next session, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but briefly, what happened was this. She's written this first vision in a letter to Eli Jacobs, who was the editor of the Day Star. And she didn't, it was, it was done because she wanted him to have the light that God had given her. She never wrote it for publication. So she, Ellen White doesn't start out with a publishing work in mind. She starts out, she wants to share the information that Floyd couldn't understand. So she sends it to the editor of the Day Star because she knew him personally. She writes back later, she says, well, I had no idea he was going to publish my letter. But I, she says, but I, there's things that God has also shown me that, that it, since you published it, that the saints need to know. And what she writes back is the second vision of 45. These two visions are one vision. Mark it down. And you don't understand that until you break this down and I, when I discovered this, that the, uh, the December vision and the vision that is continued in, uh, you know how God gave Daniel visions and he would repeat and enlarge? This is the same phenomenon, the same signature in Ellen White's experience. So these two visions are part of the one. So when you read it now, when you read these visions, and we as the, uh, the brethren, what we've done is we've busted these visions up and We've got them in early writings, and even Ellen White herself sanctioned the writing of early writings, but you don't get the whole picture when they're broken out like that. Mm -hmm. But the, the truth is that this vision and this vision, God has given to her as containing one whole story, which is very important for us to grasp. And with that, let's go have breakfast. And uh, I hope you learned something about I've been this morning. And we're going to ask about volunteers. I need volunteers in the kitchen. Okay, we got one, two, three, four. <laughs> All right, let's have a prayer. <laughs> Loving Father in heaven, Lord, your mercy endures forever. Lord, this late in verse history, as it was in the time of the Millerites, you're not willing that any should perish. And we thank you, Lord, that you're the one who uh, is the revealer of those things that are revealed to us by the prophets. Please bless uh, this small group that is meeting here today, that they will take these home things home in their hearts, and they will... Uh, we, Lord, we owe you a debt that we can never pay. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. 
But Lord, we would ask you by that grace that we would uh, finish this work and that Jesus would come. And those that you want to save will be saved. 